Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Welcome back to another Tank Talk podcast. Glad you're here. Glad you are here with the number one aquarium podcast show on the face of the earth. You've made it that way. Glad you're here, John. What do we got going on today? What are we? What am I? What are we talking about today? We're going to talk about something that I'm very excited to talk about, which is the journey your fish takes from birth all the way to your aquarium and all the different ways that it could be done, uh, the different paths that they could be taking and uh, get give you a good understanding of how these fish could be uh, in for a nice long ride from Absolutely. the farm to your tank. And I, what I hope is that as we go through this discussion today, you're gonna start to realize why it is so important to quarantine your fish when you bring them home and that is a subject we're actually going to be covering in a couple weeks why we quarantine how we quarantine and we're going to get into that so if you haven't already subscribed please do because we're going to be talking about a lot of really interesting things over the next couple weeks i believe next week we've got canister filters on the way absolutely right? as I'm a excited. recent convert to canister filters the tanks behind me if you're watching on youtube they're all being run via canister filters, and I used to have a very low opinion of them, but I have grown to accept their role in the hobby. So we'll be talking about that next week, but that's not this week. This no, week. And, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I had to jump in here real quick because I'm going to tell you something. In that episode next week about canister filters, I am going to make a statement in that video that is going to break the internet. I'm just saying. It's, it's You've already be a got a pre-planned break the internet statement? It is. I might get canceled next week. It might wow. be over for me. My career might be completely over. So well, be, I, be tuned I in for that. I look to watching that destruction. So, <laughs> Well, you're coming down <laughs> with me, so. <laughs> I don't think I plan to make a statement that's going to break the internet, but <laughs> I just can't claim that. Well, who knows? Maybe that will happen. So in today's subject, yeah, today's subject, what we're talking about is the pathway from where your fish are born to your aquarium. And like John already mentioned, there are a few different ways, two different, a few different pathways that your fish can take and with the eventual resting place or hopefully a swimming place in your aquarium. I think perhaps the most common one, when you're just talking about the vast majority of tropical fish that you would find at a local fish store or your big box store, it doesn't start in your state. It doesn't even start in the United States. Mm -mm. It actually starts overseas. And you might be surprised to learn the overwhelming majority of fish that are supplied in the aquarium hobby originate somewhere on the other side of the earth. And there are lots of different places that they can originate, depends on the types of fish. If you are looking at a lot of your tetras, maybe some of your specialty plecos and some of your cichlids. Well, South America might be a place that they originate, especially if you're talking about angel fish, fish and epistogramma and some of the rams. But even there, that's still not the vast majority of the fish. Most of them are coming from different parts of Asia, believe it or not. Even a lot of those tetras and cichlids I just mentioned, they often breed them in large outdoor facilities overseas. And it's a very, very economical way to do that. We talked a few weeks ago, it was a really good discussion on breeding for profit. And in that video, uh, that podcast, we talked about how it can be really challenging to breed fish in the United States, especially if you're in the northern part of the U.S. where you don't necessarily have the outdoor um, the option to breed fish outdoors, it can be really challenging. And the reason for that is, as we think about where fish are coming from, at least a lot of the fish that we get in the hobby, well, they're coming from these large outdoor facilities in places like Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, believe it or not, even some parts of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Uh, I'm missing a whole bunch of them. Thailand. But that, what's that? Thailand. Th thank you very much. I knew I was missing a major one. Thailand is another <laughs> one. So, and what's happening is you've got all of these little farms everywhere and they are breeding certain types of fish and that's really where they originate. And so if we pause for a second, we have varying water parameters based on where these fish are being bred. 
you know, as, as an example, you, you think about some of the live bears, especially the mollies and the sword tails. Sometimes those fish are actually bred in brackish water outdoor ponds. And then eventually we try to convert them to fresh water. It's just an example of why sometimes that doesn't work. Now, so we've got all these, these, these fish outdoors. They're in these outdoor ponds, varying different types of water parameters. Maybe the temperatures are a little bit different. What's going to happen is these fish breeders are then going to bring these fish to an exporter. And you've got an exporter that's going to get them all bagged up together. At this point, they might be experiencing different water parameters from where they're being exported to where they were originally bred. And one of the things I think we should understand is every time we are transporting fish, that creates stress, right? I think we get stressed, John, when you have to hop on a plane and go somewhere, it's a little stressful for us, right? We got to pack, figure out everything. Well, for fish, this isn't even something that they're planning. This is something that's just happening to them. And so they're going to go from their origination to their exporter. Then what's going to happen is the exporter is going to ship these fish over the big blue ocean, and they're going to wind up at an import facility. Often with these import facilities, they're going to go through inspection. Well, they should be going through inspection. They very well may be rebagged at this point because if they've been in transport now for a couple days going from the the exporter to the importer. They're looking at the bags, they're inspecting them. Uh, one, to make sure that the fish that are coming into the country are legal. So you're gonna have that aspect, governmental inspection. But then the importers, if they're doing their job properly, they're gonna be looking at the fish and be like, okay, did everything show up alive? What kind of condition are they in? Do we need to rebag them? Or maybe what they're doing is they're putting them in temporary holding tanks so that they can fulfill orders from all of the wholesalers across the country who have ordered fish. So at this point, we've already got transit of at least a few days and potentially three different sets of water parameters. Once the fish are at the importer, now they are put in hopefully new bags and they're going to be shipped out to usually wholesalers. And the job of the wholesalers, these facilities are huge. In fact, I did a tour of one of the wholesale facilities in our area, APET. It's a very, very large facility thousands of tanks and so a lot of these fish from the importer are going to go to wholesalers throughout the united states where now we are dealing with what what potential water parameter number four and again more transport so that might take another day or so to get from the importer to the wholesaler there these fish are going to sit in tanks for it depends on how popular the fish are anywhere from maybe less than a day to a week or two or more depends on the wholesaler, depends on the, the market. Those fish are then going to travel from a wholesaler to a pet store. That's usually just going to be a, a uh, usually a one day thing. Now we're dealing with potential water parameters. Number five, right? Another new aquarium. And then finally you show up, <laughs> you show up to your pet store and here's those fish that you expect to be in awesome condition and just looking great and full of color. And they have basically traveled more in the last seven days than you may travel in your entire life times 10. So they get to the pet store. Now you buy them, you take them home. They are now potentially in fish tank number six with different water parameters and different setup. And so that is a general overview of how some fish travel through the system. Now there are other ways, uh, and John, I'll let you speak to this. What what you're familiar with, some of the things that you have seen as well. Well, yeah, the, the interesting thing about it is when I talk to people who don't know how all this works, a lot of times what they think happens is uh, my friend Mark, your, your friend now too, Mark from Aquariums Unlimited has a store in Virginia Beach and uh, he orders them from Indonesia and they get shipped directly to him. Mm -hmm. No, that's not how that works. There's so many more people involved uh, whether it's transshippers or just importers and distributors. And there's so many steps to this process. It's very, very rare that you find a pet store that's dealing direct with the fish farms. They're out there, but most of them are going to be buying them exactly how you just said, uh, sometimes dealing with a nationwide distributor like a Seagrest Farms or a Sun Pet or something like that. Uh, but a lot of times dealing with local distributors that are driving truck routes 
So, you know, Mark from Aquariums Unlimited, he buys a lot of his fish from a distributor that I also use. Um, and so his fish, rather than being shipped through a freight system or, or UPS or something like that, the, the distributor loads them up in his own van, brings them out. Um, but they're not coming direct from the farm. They're not coming from a major nationwide distributor. They're coming from a local person. But, you know, most people just think that the fish are just sent directly to the fish store. Uh, and they're certainly not. And a lot of people, I certainly encourage everyone to buy uh, fish from your local mom and pop store. But if you're ordering online, a lot of people are afraid well, isn't that going to be super, super stressful to ship the fish through FedEx or UPS? Do you know what these fish have already been through? I mean, they have been through, they've gone for a ride already halfway across the world. If they can withstand that, they can withstand a little trip from North Carolina to Missouri. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, right. But it, it's no wonder that quarantining, like the episode we're going to be doing coming up, uh, is so important. And it's also no wonder that sometimes you get fish and they're maybe not in the best condition. They don't look like the ones you see in the magazine. It's because they've been through uh, a, a, an unbelievable ordeal. I'm not saying abused or tortured, but just the whole process of getting from A to Z is, uh, is quite a bit. And uh, it can stress them out, make them want to fight each other. Uh, just like you want to do when you go flying on an airplane. You want to fight everybody. If you're anything like me, you want to fight everybody by the end of that day. <laughs> well, I, I guess, yeah, that, that can happen. Uh, there are ways to shorten that, that pathway that we just talked about. So, for instance, if you have someone who is breeding fish within the borders of the United States, then you're not worried about the exporting and the importing. Right. And so those people, you know, primarily... Florida is by far, I would say, the largest uh, when it comes to fish breeders, invertebrates, shrimp, that kind of thing. And so that can potentially take some of the steps out because now you can go from fish breeding in Florida, usually directly to the pet store. And so you can skip a few steps there. The trade off is often you're going to pay more for that. Right. Yep. Because it just costs more to breed fish in the United States than it does to breed fish overseas and even transport them in. It's just it's a much more costly thing. Land here is worth a lot more. Labor costs a lot more here. So you again, your your trade off is higher costs and, and you can't breed everything here. Right. I mean, right. there are still just fish, especially in Florida, because a lot of the fish that you see in the pet stores, believe it or not, when you want to breed them, I'm not talking about keeping the fish, but breeding them. A lot of your tetras, a lot of your rasboras, these high volume, smaller fish to get them to breed in an ideal situation. You want water that's going to be a little bit on the softer side. The pH is not going to be kicking so high like it is in Florida. Florida is liquid rock in a lot yep. of places in Florida. <laughs> so you, you're not breeding a lot of the fish there. No, they can import them themselves and then grow them out in some of those those uh, outdoor ponds. But so you are limited in the United States to, as to what you're actually going to be able to breed at scale. Obviously, the way and you dealt with this and you can speak to this more, the way that you deal with this from a pet store perspective is the pet store buys local from local breeders. Right. And mm -hmm. then you've cut out pretty much as many steps as you can. Yeah, that is a lot more challenging than you might think though. Um, mm -hmm. It's not, it, it, when you're running a business, you want everything to be as streamlined and as simple as possible because you know, the easier the better, right? So if you're, if you have a guy for guppies and a guy for angels and a guy for betas and a guy for the, or a girl for this, and a, it's like, oh, who do I order those from again? It's so much easier to order things from you know, all from one place, but we did have a couple of, um, of people that we dealt with that were breeding specific types of fish. We knew where they were coming from. They, we knew they were good for our water. So that's a bonus. You mentioned that in our breeding for profit episode. Uh, that was a big, big bonus because everybody that was coming to our store for the most part was having the same water parameters right out of the tap that the breeder was. So that worked out really good, but that is a, a difficult thing to do to keep track of 
all of the different places that you're going to buy from. Uh, but, you know, if you got somebody that's doing it right and they're creating a good product, you'll do it. You'll, you'll yeah. jump through those hoops to do that. And the thing is, too, like we talked about with the breeding for profit, if your local breeders are breeding fish that are typically not going to ship all that well, and based on the, the supply chain that we just talked about, I'm thinking, believe it or not, your bristlenose plecos, your angel fish when they're smaller, uh, a lot of the, I found that it's, it's really tough sometimes, even for certain rasboras, for some of the, like the half beaks, really hard to get those through the supply chain and have them show up at your door and be like, wow, okay, these fish are just rocking and they're just doing awesome, ready to go right back out the door to our customers. So yeah, you, you have to be somewhat selective as a pet store in terms of what you're going to buy locally. And the other thing that I'm sure is a headache for people, for pet store owners is just because there is a source for something local doesn't mean it's always consistent, right? You you have True. people who just, they're in the hobby. They, they switch their the, what they're breeding, even if oh, I breed angelfish, why well, I was getting these awesome Philippine blues from this guy, turns out now he's breeding kois. And that's not what I need because I can actually get those cheaper somewhere right. else. And the other issue too is when you're looking at the cost structure, unfortunately, sometimes people who are breeding fish, they don't realize their competition. And I don't want to get too far into this one because we've kind of covered some of this already, but they don't realize, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to sell you. I'll, I'll use shell dwellers as an example, the Lake Tang, you can shell dwellers. Okay, I'm going to, I see you selling these things for $12 a piece. Give me eight bucks. Right. <laughs> Dude, you understand that. Well, and these aren't even cheap fish, but I could buy them from a wholesaler for less than that. And if I get them imported, I might only be paying two bucks a piece. Right. So I'm not buying them from you for $8 because especially if they're coming in, and I'm not saying they would come in all the time you know, in, in awesome shape, but I have brought in shell dwellers before. I remember bringing in Brevis and, and the really good places, they will package them into, now it stinks to unbox them, but individual mm -hmm. little bags, individual little bags, never lost a single one. And, wow. and you know, you've got the people who are trying to sell them to the pet stores for, well, I'll sell them to you for half of what you pay or what you sell them for. No, you don't understand. I can get them for 20% of what I sell them for. And that's, that's something that's necessary when you've got overhead and lights and employees to pay and insurance sure. and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, you got to be selective. Yeah. And that we had that happen so many times. And I, I talked about, uh, in our breeding for profit episode, my friend, Dave Warren, that was breeding those angels. I was so thankful when he came in the store and he wanted to sell me angels. He already knew, you know, he knew, okay, it's not with live animals. You're not talking about the 50% you know, whatever you're there charging, I can get 50% of that, you know, that that's not realistic. And he knew that. And uh, so we didn't have to go back and forth on price all that much. And he had a great product. Uh, but but yeah, it's, there might be a little bit of a shock going back to breeding for profit. When you go to sell those to a pet store, you're not going to get probably what you're thinking you're going to get for them. Because yeah. it's it is so easy to get them imported. Uh, you do not have to have an importer's license. So many people think you have to. In order to import, you have to. No, there's these people that are called transshippers that'll help you out with all of that. They charge you a little bit of a fee. It's easy to get fish from overseas, and it's so much cheaper than uh, yeah. than a local guy. I mean, an yeah, argument I, can be made. It's not the as good of a product, but you know, it's all about money when you're in business. Well, and, and there's a couple things there too. When you look at, again, the supply chain thing, yeah, it can be cheaper, but you gotta be really careful. I mean, I know we talked for, about breeding for profit and a lot of people are like, oh, you know what? I'll just import for profit. Oh my gosh, you can run into a massive disaster doing that real quick. Mm -hmm. If you don't have significant amount of experience, significant amount of experience in the fish keeping hobby with the fish that you're bringing in, I mean, you can easily, easily lose many, many thousands of dollars real quick. So there's, mm -hmm. there's reward there, but it's also high risk. But the other interesting thing that I have found, and I don't know if you have had a similar experience, but what I have found is the further the fish go through the supply chain, the more stops they make, the more likely they are to be sick. And what I mean by that is what's interesting for me is I do import a lot of fish and what's kind of, it, it, it struck me as strange until I realized you know, I really studied the supply chain and that is I almost, I think there was one time where I brought in fish and they wound up with ick. 
once. And I'm wow. talking at this point, many tens of thousands of fish and one time, one bag, one type of fish had ick. Wow. Turns out, at least it seems to me that what's happening is I'm not necessarily talking about internal parasites or bacterial infections, but as you go further down the supply chain, I think you increase the likelihood of the fish winding up with something. And it especially so the further you go down, I think that problem primarily is lying really close to the, the final end user. That's where that problem happens. And when we do talk about quarantine, a lot of people naturally are going to be like, well, okay, well, listen, why do I have to quarantine for four weeks? Wouldn't it just be better if the importer quarantined for four weeks or the wholesaler or the pet store? And it turns out it's not necessary often for the exporter or the importer and a lot of times even for the wholesaler but it really does that burden should properly be falling on maybe wholesaler definitely pet store and absolutely us the further you go down the supply chain the more important it is for that that entity or that person to quarantine but they're not coming out of a lot of these places with a lot of external parasites they're, they're right. just not now again internal parasites maybe uh we can that's a different discussion but i just haven't found that to be the, the the case when it comes to the fish that when we're skipping those steps yeah i mean a, a fish farm wants you to buy fish from them and then buy them from them again so they're not gonna pack like look at a pond and be like oh all those fish are sick they're all gonna die well I'll ship them anyway i mean if they do that you know never to buy from that farm again as yeah, a fish yeah. store you would never want to buy from that farm again but you know they're packing you up fish that are in good shape they're starting out in good shape but because they go through so much the water gets foul things are gross they're changing water parameters every day they're they go through a lot they're susceptible vulnerable whatever you want to say to catching some kind of, of issue so yeah yeah this is again quarantining <laughs> goes right and, back and, to it yeah and, and you brought up a good point the throughout the supply chain people want they're in the business of either breeding raising or selling fish and so the only way that they stay in business is when they breed raise or sell fish that are healthy so and it, it is well known when you get into the circles hey you know what there's there's a number of different places where you can get a neon tetra or a cardinal tetra but you start to learn okay which locations are the best typically and then those locations by meaning what, what region do we want to buy these fish from considering that the prices are going to be different the import quantities are going to be different but then not only that for that exporter they need to know which specific farms that is that's allowing them to have that good that good re relationship right. and that and and, and have a, a a good reputation that's the word I was looking for, because that the word gets around like, oh, you know what? I know we've got five options for Cardinal Tetras and I can get them from someplace in South America and I can get them from three different places across Asia. But this is the place where everybody's bringing them in and they're doing awesome. Right. It's and you, you also have to be careful, too, because depending on where these fish originate, sometimes the water parameters can be drastically different. I remember I don't know, you know, Ted Judy, of course. Uh, Ted Judy is, you know, he was a, a pillar in the aquarium hobby. And I specifically remember him doing a video. This must have been seven or eight years ago, I think. And what they were doing is they were testing the water parameters. I, I believe, again, it's been a long time. I thought they were Altum Angels. There was some type of angel fish, I think. And they were actually testing water parameters. Okay, here's the water parameters of the water when we caught the fish. And it was ridiculously, the pH was ridiculous ridiculously low but then it actually went even lower once the fish were in the bag and started producing waste so i think it was like it started maybe in the fives and got all the way down into like the mid to low fours if memory serves me correctly and so then they were making a point you think when you get these fish in that oh my ph of six is going to be fine which is also let's face it it's fairly extreme in the in the, in the aquarium hobby where if people are keeping a, a ph of six that's not the norm and right. you're thinking, oh, this is going to be great until you realize, well, well, test, test the water in the bag because that water is like four, three right now. And they were used to low to mid fives. So you've got to be really careful there because you might be able to get a certain type of angelfish or a certain type of tetra at a different location where it started out at seven. 
And that just happens to be what these fish are used to. They're actually breeding in that water. Yes, I under the biggest mistake that we make sometimes is we think that just because a fish is found in nature in a certain water parameter, that's, that's exactly the best water parameter. That's not always the case. And that that is the water parameter that is going to long term allow the fish to breed the best. And that's also not always the case. Sometimes you change those water parameters. Yes, the fish are surviving and they're, they're doing a decent job of thriving in those water parameters. Really good example. We had somebody come in and speak to us at the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, and they studied the satellite lakes around Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi, so the, the big Great Lakes in Africa, and they were looking at cichlids, they were studying cichlids, and they went to the soda lakes. And these lakes are like a pH above nine, like nine and a half. The water hardness is insane. It's absolutely insane. And oh, by the way, the temperatures were like 90 degrees. Oh, so they've my. got Yes, they've got these soda lake cichlids, and we had people in our clubs keeping these fish at like 90 degrees and these crazy water parameters. And then they started really studying them. And what they found is even though that's where they're found in nature, they actually have a pretty short lifespan, partially due because of that really high pH and the high water temperatures. And when you cooled those fish down, it's like 83 and brought the pH down into like the upper eights instead of the mid nines, they live years longer years fascinating so you, while most of the time it is fair to say if you want to breed fish get them closer to the water parameters that you find in nature that is not always the case and you can develop strains that will breed in water that is much more similar to what most people have in the united states you have to find those places so that you can ensure that those fish are going to be really thriving in your aquarium and that's the job of the people who are bringing fish in where they're importing and they're they're relaying information to their wholesalers and for the people who are buying from the 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 importers like okay hey, these are the farms where they're going to do the best in the united states or at least in certain regions i think the one of the best examples of what you're talking about here is discus because you know that you go back 20 years everybody labeled discus as being the most difficult fish in the world to keep they were so difficult because they required such soft water and the extremely low pH and super high temperatures. And, but then now, and, and it's been for a very long time, now we all know that there's this farm out of Germany that promotes their discus as being bred and raised in tap water, 7.6. And you're like, wait a second, that makes no sense because that is not what the magazine told us back in the 80s but you know they adapt and it, it takes them generations and it takes them a really long time but this is what they're breeding and it if you read a book about discus in the wild in the amazon you're going to find that they're from very soft water very warm and so you set your tank up that way you put all your peat moss in there and all your driftwood to bring your ph way down and you crank up that temperature and everything's perfect and then you buy your discus from Stenker, a, a Stenker retailer that's getting them from Germany and a pH of 7.6. That's not good for those fish. No. So you, you're, at, you're spot on in consider where they're from. Maybe not where they originate, you know, if they were to be caught wild, mm -hmm. but the, where you're getting them from, from the breeder you know, their, their situation is going to be way different than what the book says, because they're going to work with what they've got. They're, yeah. they're not going to, you know, drastically alter the water in major facilities. I mean, it would just, it would cost millions to do something like that. So they're going to work yeah. with what they got. And you should match that, not what the book says that the, the natural environment. I understand, I'm sorry to go off on a little rant here. I understand that there are some fish that you really de do need to have spot on water parameters to get them to breed and things like that. But just keeping them, not necessarily. Yeah. yeah, and that's a good point about the discus too because there are some pretty successful breeders in the Chicagoland area. And our water, uh, when it's coming from Lake Michigan, is usually pretty close to a pH of eight. GH and KH can be pretty close to 10 degrees. And there are people breeding discus pretty close to those water parameters, certainly keeping them without any issues. They're thriving, full of color. They live a long, healthy, happy life. And that's well outside the range of where you would normally think that discus need to be kept. And But you've brought up a really important point, and that is wild caught. 
because when you're looking at the supply chain there, now obviously we've narrowed it down considerably and a lot of people, they see that designation wild caught fish and they think that they are better. I'm going to say something controversial. Uh oh. I'm about to break the internet. <laughs> I would say for the average fish keeper, wild caught is almost always worse. For the average Agreed. fish keeper, wild caught fish are almost always worse. Why? Because those wild caught fish, especially when they are coming from an area that has drastically different water parameters than you have. Again, I did a video on water hardness and I actually showed a map of the United States most of the United States has water that's on the harder side. Either it's groundwater, it's coming from surface water that has a lot of limestone and stuff. So a lot of us have water that's on the harder side, water that is certainly over a pH of seven. Yes, there are places in the U.S. that don't have that. But if you are going to be buying wild caught fish from, let's say, South America, like the discus you just mentioned, like some of the quarry cats or some of the tetras, oh, I got these wild caught. They're going to be the best. They're going to be healthy and hardy because they were out in nature. And then you throw them in your tank without making the necessary adjustments to your water parameters. You just wasted a lot of money. Most likely they're all going to die. Yep. And they are probably going to be more prone to infection when you first bring them in, if the water parameters are drastically different. So be really careful with the whole wild caught thing. The caveat to that is of course, if you are trying to breed or if you do have water parameters that closely match, then there is an advantage there. So I'm thinking African cichlids, you've kept a lot of African cichlids and that can be a really strong way to, to diversify your genetics. We're like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to bring in some yellow labs that are wild caught. I'm going to bring in some shell dwellers or some Lake Tanganyikan fish. Let me go ahead and get my, 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 my genetics in my, my population. Just let's make sure I'm not breeding these fish down where I'm starting to get some mutations in here that are building up. So that's an advantage, but that's not what I'm talking about because the, you're watching this as, as the audience, I have news for you. If you're watching or listening to this podcast right now, we are what you what we call a fish nerd. You're a fish <laughs> nerd. And that's cool. That's awesome. So are we. And we're glad that you're here fish nerding. But you are not representative of probably 95% of the fish keeping community, right? That's right. We all nerd out. We're like, Aquashella, yeah, fish clubs, awesome. <laughs> Listening to podcasts, watching videos. It's such a minuscule amount. Uh, percentage of the people watching. And so for the overwhelming majority, when they see that, when they go to a pet store and they see wild caught, me personally, I generally stay away from those fish. I, it, when too. I see the lists, I never buy purposely buy fish that are labeled wild caught. And the reason for that is I know my water parameters, right? And I know that unless they're African cichlids, I can't give these fish the same water parameters. And there is a risk there with wild caught fish that they are going to bring in some type of environmental pathogen that they have that are naturally immune and you bring them in here and you spread that around your fish room good luck with that it only takes yeah. one time for that to happen you're like oh wow yeah that that was brutal i don't know what happened i don't know what the fish had but it wiped out five tanks yeah i i've had in my over a decade on social media talking about fish i've had so many people come to me wanting to drastically alter their water parameters to meet a particular type of fish to meet what the book says and I, my response to those people is always why why are you going to do that are you ordering these fish wild caught well no okay well then you're not going to be matching the water that that fish is used to what i tell people is the only time you should be drastically altering your water parameters is a, if you want to breed, or two, and that's only some fish, um, but two is if you're getting wild caught, then yeah. you certainly should, you know, uh, meet what they're used to, make it easier on them, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, going to these great lengths and changing your water parameters up, I mean, some people have horrible water. I, I get it. They have no choice. If they want to keep fish, they have to do that. But most of us regular people that are just getting water out of the tap, you shouldn't be needing to drastically change your water parameters to keep a particular fish again, unless they're wild caught. Yeah. And in some, in some ways you can't get around it too. So I want to be careful there. A lot of your loaches, they're, they're just not 
a lot of these loaches are not easily bred in captivity. So you, you know, think about especially, I think there have been some reports that maybe people are starting to breed clown loaches now in large outdoor facilities, but a lot of those historically have been wild caught and they do pretty well. I mean, we bring in clown loaches all the time and uh, they are one of the fish that we very rarely have issues with a lot of loaches. We, we just don't have that many issues with. So it's not to say that that's a blanket statement that wild caught is always going to be worse and you're always going to have problems. And, but those are also fish that you don't really need to, to match the water parameters exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, if, if we're being honest with each other, I'm just going to tell you straight up, I, I'm just not a fan of wild caught fish, period. I mean, you're taking them out of unlimited space and putting them in a little glass box. Not a big fan of it. All these fish that I have in my fish house, well, except for the saltwater fish, are they've always been in a glass box. So, yeah. you know, the wild, we should do an entire episode on wild caught fish. At some oh, point. and yeah, that, you know what, we are absolutely going to, I don't know if that's on our list or not. I, it is, it is. I, I, I bet it's, you it it's is. Number uh, 347 on our, <laughs> our list of things to talk about. But yeah, because I did a, a video about that, a couple different videos, and I actually sat down with um, freshwater exotics. And what they do is they bring in plecos from South America that are, they have to be wild caught. They don't, most of what they're, what they're bringing in, they don't breed very easily in captivity. And so that sparked an entire discussion on wild caught fish. I know you probably talked about it before, but yeah, that is a, a whole separate conversation on whether or not it's a good idea. Sometimes it's, it's the only way to get those fish into the hobby, but then you could argue when the fish shouldn't be in the hobby, right? We just did a video on fish that shouldn't be in the hobby, but we approached that video almost exclusively based on the fact that the fish we came up with last week were too big for most aquariums or way too aggressive. We didn't even address should certain fish be in the hobby because you can't breed them in captivity and you might be doing some damage to the environment. So yeah, that's a, that's a whole nother subject. Yeah. The analogy that I like to use, and it always makes people feel really bad. It, I, and maybe I shouldn't say this. I don't know. I'll think about it. And if it's that bad, maybe I'll edit it out. But I personally am not a fan of keeping birds as pets. Mm -hmm. um, and it's for the exact reason that I was just talking about. You have a bird that is, has the world it can do the thing that every human being at some point has dreamt of being able to do to be like kal-el and be able to fly around you're taking something that can do that and you're confining it to a cage i'm not a fan you're not a bad person if you keep birds i'm not against you and i'm not going to hold a sign out in front of your yard i'm just <laughs> saying me personally i'm not a fan of that and i look at wild caught fish the same way it's like you have this you know uh, who knows how big they are. Two thirds of the world is water and you're confining them to a glass box. I'm not a fan. So but, I, I think there are a couple exceptions to the birds. One, if you want to keep chickens or ostriches, right? They don't okay, fly. Sure. All right. So just to be clear, if you, if you want to keep a chicken and an ostrich. Yeah. Ostriches. Yeah, sure. Uh, and we plan on actually keeping chickens, uh, but that's, Again, yeah, chickens aren't going to fly around. If they do fly, they fly for like three feet and they land. That's pretty much the same distance I can fly. So I'm not worried about them. And plus those things <laughs> that the female... your arms hard enough. That's right. If I jump off of a high thing, I can fly about the same distance as a chicken. Plus, I really love what the females produce every single day. I uh, eat them every single day. So uh, chickens, yeah, there's definitely an exception there. Never even looked into keeping an ostrich, but uh, sure. Yeah, that's fine, too. <laughs> yep. Uh, last last pathway I think we, we can talk about here because we basically started with the longest path from getting fish to from point A to your aquarium. We briefly mentioned, hey, there are breeders in the United States that are more or less they're, they're outdoor breeders, certainly in the state of Florida. So that kind of shortens up the supply chain. We talked about people selling fish from a... Uh, from their breeding stock to the pet store to your aquarium. And I think the last one is the absolute shortest pathway to your aquarium. And that is you, you buy directly from the person breeding the fish, right? Mm -hmm. So whether, and the shortest, shortest way to do that, of course, is buying locally. So if you know a local breeder and you look up on the internet or whatever, Hey, who are the, 
who are people selling fish in my area? And you're like, oh, I want these fish. And it just so happens that I can drive over there or meet somewhere and they're taking them right out of their aquarium then putting them right in my quarantine tank. That is by far the least stressful, I would imagine, uh, because you're skipping all of the, the airlines, you're skipping all the trucks. You've got one car ride from basically where they uh, have originated. They may have never been caught a day in their life until that day. They're going right in your tank and may never be netted again in their entire life. They've experienced a grand total of two environments mm -hmm. and possibly if they're local, it's pretty much the same water parameter. So I think that is the absolute shortest short of breeding the fish yourself, but then you've already got them. So what are you actually adding? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> the, the intimidating thing I think for most people is how do you find those people? And uh, it, it's not always as easy as an internet search, but I tell you an easy way to do it is to go, you know, every town has an aquarium club. I mean, mine, yeah. I have to drive in two and a half, two and a half hours to get to our club, uh, which is why we don't go every month. But uh, the Raleigh Aquarium Society is a club that Lisa and I are members of. And you go to one of those meetings. It's funny, you walk away from a meeting and you're like, I feel like I know people that do everything in the fish keeping hobby. Like, yeah. I know the guy, if I need to get this, I can go to him. If I need that, I go to him. It, it's just one meeting, you know, you'll feel like that. Um, yeah. And you also have, and I've done this and it's amazing. It's so much fun. If you do find that local guy or girl, um, you have the ability, this might not mean something to everybody, but you have that ability to go to their place and see the parents. Yeah, of the fish that and again, that might not mean anything to some people. But if I'm buying angelfish and I can see the pair that produce the angelfish, that's that's just cool to me. That like something that I can embed in the old brain there and and always know that I, I was able to see those. I know it sounds corny, but I'm a soft person. I I get a kick out of things like that. But uh, but yeah, I agree. That's you're not going to find better fish that are more suited for your water parameters. Uh, because they're bred in your water parameters. So right. it's perfect. Yeah, and I, I understand what you're saying because we are lucky in our area alone, we've got the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, the Greenwater Aquarius Society, the Chicago Live Bear Society, the Chicago Plant Society. Uh, that's four right there and a whole mess load of different swaps where people are breeding fish, bringing them to the swap, selling them right there. They pull them out of their aquarium that day and in your, in your quarantine tank, they're going to go that day and it's basically what we just talked about. Now you don't even have to meet someone's house. You don't have to meet in some, I don't grocery store parking lot. They are there at the swap and you're watching those fish. They're healthy. They're in a bag. It's the first time they've probably ever been in a bag. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's always fun to do that. I, I wanted to, to touch on something uh, real quick that I don't know if you plan to, and if you did, I, I apologize for stepping on your toes, but popped into my head and I think it's important to talk about. Um, there is a there's opportunity to buy fish from people that you do not know that are overseas online this is particularly prevalent prevalent in the beta community um if you start searching online there's there's plenty of retailers in the united states that sell online um and i would encourage you to order from those but maybe you're one of those people that wants the perfect beta this specific type that you've never seen anywhere and you come across a website that's in Thailand. Uh, you know, everybody knows Thailand is kind of like the Mecca of betas. Um, and and you're feeling weird about ordering from this place that there's a language barrier and you, you don't really know how the whole process works. Well, 100% of the time, unless you're somebody that has a, an importer's license, you're going to deal with somebody that's called a transshipper. And this trans shipper is somebody that is a middleman uh, that's going to get their fee, which means you're going to pay a whole lot more for that beta than you would if you ordered one from a company in the United States or went down to your local mom and pop and bought one. Um, but the trans shipper is the one that holds all of those certificates and all of those uh, uh, licenses and stuff like that can bring the fish in for you and then we'll ship it to you. Uh, we m dealt with a guy out of Dallas that would 
you know, get the fish from his farm and then ship them to us. But he would also do this for a lot of individual fish orders from just customers, just people that uh, they want to order a beta from this farm and they deal with the farm directly. Uh, and he would, they would use him to get those. Uh, this is not as intimidating and as crazy of a process as you might think. Um, you are skipping a step. We, we talked about this earlier. Um, if, if you were to buy from a pet store, you're skipping two steps, yeah. you know, because instead of it being imported and then going to the distributor and then going to the pet store and then going to you, you're skipping out the distributor and the pet store. So that's good. Makes the trip a little easier for the fish. But I just know a lot of people are scared of that um, because they don't know these trans shipper people. What's that all about? The biggest piece of advice that I would give to anybody is just chat with that trans shipper for a little bit. I mean, I, I did that. We dealt with four or five different trans shippers and, uh, and they were all, you know, we got to know them a little bit. We talked with them a little bit and if they're pushy and angry and mean and short with you and stuff, well, I don't feel like dealing with that person, but if they're nice and they're helpful and they explain the whole process and they let you know why there's a fee and why there's all this, it makes you feel a lot, a lot more at ease with the whole process. And it's really not as difficult as you might think. And this is not just for betas. There's so many things that are available. You, you kind of fall down that rabbit hole searching for that perfect fish. You might have to do it this way. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that buying fish this way is better. I don't necessarily believe it is because you're going to pay a lot more. Yeah. Um, because me, when I was ordering 300 fish at a time, 300 betas, uh, well, Lisa did this, but we would pay a fee to the transshipper of $150. If we ordered one fish, we'd be paying, paying a fee of $150. So maybe not $150, but it would be a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to pay more. But, you know, if you're after that perfect fish, it might be worth it to you. A, a thing is only as valuable as you say it's, you know, whatever you say its value is. So if it's worth it for you, go ahead and do it. It's not as crazy of a system as you might think. Yeah, and you brought up a couple of good points, right? You can, that's absolutely a thing that you can do, but usually for most people, the cost is prohibitive unless you find something that's really awesome, either the cost or the quantity, because you mentioned just there's a fee just to get the fish into the country and have it inspected and have it go through all the proper channels. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is that can add up in a hurry. So it's not uncommon that, you know, you mentioned the 300 bettas, which would probably fit in a, a large shipping box easily, 100 to <clears throat> 120 to $150, not for the fish, just to get the box into the country. It doesn't matter right. what fish is in there. So as an example, you might have two or three large fish. Doesn't matter. That was 150 bucks because and, mm -hmm. and probably more because you're actually using more water. So you might pay 120 to 150 bucks to get that in. And then you're going to have to go pick it up somewhere. Sometimes you have to pick it up in an airport. Uh, well, usually you have to pick it up in an airport because those trans shippers, if they're just if you're buying one, maybe they'll ship it to your house. That's an additional fee. Right. Besides getting the fish in. And then if you're dealing with quantity, not many people have the ability to be like, boy, you know what? I really like this new Tetra I just saw. Sure could use six. That's fine. But the minimum order quantity is 400. And you're like, right. <laughs> $400 times four bucks a piece plus the 150 in the shipping plus the fee that I have to pay at the at the um, the airport to get the fish. Uh, off the off their dock and now I've got to find a place for my new 400 fish and I've got a 29 gallon so <laughs> when when you see when when you hear about people who are bringing in fish massive massive quantities massive quantities and again there's risk there there's a significant amount of risk there if something goes wrong because it's on you right the best you're going to get is wow, you know what? I've got this bag of 200 fish and half of them showed up dead. Okay, well, here's the refund for your half fish, but you're never getting the shipping back. So right. the shipping is, is, you've lost that. And sometimes for some of these fish, the shipping can be more than the actual cost of the fish. Sometimes a lot more. So, I mean, you're shipping you them overnight overseas. I yeah. mean, it's, it's a lot of money. Now for Lisa and I, I don't know how it is for you, but for Lisa and I, we were fortunate that we were buying fish that ship really well and in very little water 
Uh, so a, a box can hold 300 of them and it would be very, not light, but it's not like you need to get a hand truck to, to get them through the, the room. You know, you can carry them comfortably. Um, but even still, you know, we, we'd have to pay the shipping from the farm to Dallas and then the transshipper fee and then the FedEx overnight fee from Dallas to us or UPS or whatever it was that he used. So it, it does end up being a lot. And again, this is how this is why you're not paying five dollars for a fish and selling it for 10 yeah. you're buying you're paying five dollars and you're selling it for 20 because there's all right. those other in, uh individual little fees in there and stuff like that not to mention all the unbagging and caring for the fish and all you got to sure your time is worth money as well absolutely uh, yeah absolutely yeah i mean in, in my particular situation the fish i bring in they need a lot of there's a trade-off right so the trade-off is the more water you put in a bag the more likely the fish are going to show up in decent shape so the less for the fish that i keep you know if i'm doing a ton of tetras rasboras all kinds of stuff so yeah it's kind of nice if there's a decent amount of water in the bag but that added weight you're getting less fish uh or less bags in a box so that's going to increase your shipping costs but potentially more of your fish are going to show up not unalive so uh <laughs> the, the trade-off is when you've got 100 200 fish in a bag yeah you want a decent amount of water in there unfortunately now you're paying a lot more in shipping so there's always a balance there's always and that's where like you said when you hook up with the people who really know what they're doing they know based on the fish how much water do we need to put in there how much are we going to how many fish are we going to put in a bag because the other thing to consider too is yeah you could order a few hundred fish they put them all in one bag as soon as some of those fish start to die it, it creates an ammonia spike and now they're all gone Right. Where if you split that into maybe four bags, now you're taking up a whole box. But if a couple of fish die in one bag and one bag goes south, you still have the other three. So you didn't lose everything or, you know, you even wind up with 300 fish that are really on the on the edge there. Yeah, I, I'm really good friends with Discus Hans. I, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Um, he was the sole distributor of Stenker Discus in the United States up until recently. But uh I was at his place one time when he received a shipment because he was a direct importer. He didn't deal with um, transshippers and all that kind of stuff. He would go to BWI airport, pick them up and bring, and it would shock you how heavy those boxes were. Yeah. I mean, because you're dealing, you know, he would be bringing in fish that are five inches and, you know, yeah. he would bring in the little ones too, but even the little ones, you'd have 20 in a bag and one bag in a box, the big mm -hmm. box. Yep. because they're delicate they're discus and you know you're not going to stick 400 of them in one little ga gallon size bag right. uh it was crazy the amount of money he had to pay for shipping from germany to baltimore uh, absolutely outrageous but the good yep. thing for me was uh the betas you know the farms would basically the farms knew how much it cost to ship to dallas because they dealt with the train shipper that i dealt with so they knew they would be like, okay, if it's, if you buy a hundred fish, it's this much. And that includes shipping to the United States. Uh, or if you buy this much, they would have it all broken down like that. So that made it easier, but yeah, it's complicated. But at the end of the day, it's like a Mac computer. You're intimidated by it when you first look at it, but then once you learn how to use it, it's really, really easy. Yep. Very true. <laughs> so I, yeah, I think, uh, Again, if you've learned anything from this discussion, it is quarantine your fish. We're going to get into how to do that, like I said, in a couple of weeks, because you just you don't know necessarily what path that fish has taken to finally get to your aquarium. If you quarantine, if they're stressed out, it gives them a place where they don't have to deal with competition for food as much. They don't have to deal with other fish. They don't have to deal with fish that are maybe slightly aggressive. And now it's like, oh my gosh, I just went through the worst period of my life. And now I've got fish chasing me around because they're slightly territorial or I'm trying to figure out a new environment. Give them a nice low light area where they can just chill out, where you can observe them, be patient. And again, we'll talk about all these things in a couple weeks and then they will be a fish that you'll enjoy for a lot longer. Agreed. And I, I will have a couple of personal uh, nightmare stories about not quarantining. Uh, so those should be fun. <laughs> We've all done it. We've all done it. So 
Everyone, thank you. Thank you again for being here. Really appreciate it. We will be back same time, same place next week. We're going to be talking about canister filters. It's going to be awesome. Thanks for being here. Yes, indeed. Thank you. We'll see you next week.